So now a little bit about bat reproduction. The bats around here typically mate in the fall and then give birth the following late spring. And many species of bats around here have something called embryonic diapause. And this is a very cool adaptation that I wish humans still retained. And what it means is when the sperm and the egg come together, they are going to form a new zygote that is a ball of cells that's going to start to divide and divide and divide and it will float down and then eventually implant in the uterus. And diapause is when that ball of cells stops and doesn't implant in the uterus. So the pregnancy essentially goes on hold. When it starts to warm up in the spring and it seems like there will be lots of insects in about six weeks for mom and baby, she'll start the pregnancy up again. And so she's not making a conscious decision for this pregnancy to start up, but environmental cues, day length, food availability, that sort of thing are going to trigger the pregnancy to start again so that she can have her baby in an optimal time. And this allows for seasonal variation. If you have a late winter, you're going to have your babies later, and if it's an early spring you can have your babies earlier. Gestation is 45 to 60 days. When the babies are born they are pink, relatively hairless, their eyes are closed. The moms carry them around for a couple days. After they're three days old they leave them behind and if they're in a roost with many other bats they'll stash them in groups. Some famous research was done down in Texas by Gary McCracken that found that mothers do locate their pups by smell and sound every night. So if you have a cave with five million bats, that means that there will be five million babies, and each one of those, their mother is going to come back and find them every night. Now they'll stash them in groups of a thousand or two thousand, and one or two females, who clearly pulled the short straw, will stay behind and watch that group for the evening. At three to four weeks, the pups are going to be able to fly. They're going to start following mom and start learning where the good spots are to eat and where the good night roosts are. This is a baby little brown bat that was several days old. It actually fell out of that horse barn roost that I showed earlier. This is the smallest possible syringe, and this little bat is sitting on a heating pad. I mentioned my mom at one point. She wasn't so sure about me doing bat research, but I talked her into coming out with me one night, and that night about six babies fell out of the roost. And I put them in a small container, and I was going to take them to a woman who does bat rehab. But in the middle of the night I heard this frantic scratching and we sh shined the light onto the uh, container and there were several adults trying to get into the box. And so the mothers were trying to come pick up their babies. Now the babies are a third of mom's weight when they're born and a small bat just isn't going to be able to take off from the ground holding onto a baby. So we took the container that we had the babies in and we put it on top of a ladder so it was about six feet above the ground. And the mothers were able to fly in, pick up their babies, babies and get enough lift from six feet up to carry them back. And so of the six babies that were in the box at the beginning of the evening, at the end only one was not picked up. And that was this little guy. I'm not sure what happened, but we brought him home. We gave him puppy formula overnight. My mom was completely hooked on bats after taking care of this little guy. We got him to the bat rehab person over in Marin County. She raised him to an adult and that fall released him back in the same barn. And as far as we know, he's still doing just fine. So one of the biggest myths about bats is that they're all coming after you to suck your blood. So of the thousand different species of bats, only three are true vampire bats. And I always find it ironic that none of those bats occur in Europe at all, which is where all the vampire stories come from. The vampire bats that we do have occur in southern Mexico, Central America, and a little bit in the northern part of South America. We don't have any vampire bats here in California. Vampire bats do have some very interesting adaptations. They have highly specialized teeth. Their front incisors are razor sharp so they can give a quick swift cut. It's a little bit like a paper cut where you can barely feel it but it bleeds and bleeds. They have a grooved tongue so that they don't have to actively lick up the blood. The blood will run by capillary action right up into their mouth. And there's a number of drug companies studying the fact that they have anticoagulant in their saliva. So normally when uh, a cut forms, it'll immediately start to clot up. But they have proteins in their saliva that keeps that from happening. 
Now most animals sleep through a vampire bat attack, so they don't fly at your throat and try and suck your blood. Instead, uh, like this uh, bat down here, they've taken a little bite on uh, the hoof of a donkey. They're feeding. The donkey is probably sleeping through this whole thing. So it's not this massive violent attack. It can be dangerous though because they can deplete blood supply and they can also spread bloodborne diseases. Of the three different kinds of vampire bats, two are endangered and not doing well as we continue to cut down rainforest. The third species is actually increasing uh, because they really like cattle and so as we cut down rainforest for uh, cheap grazing ground for cattle, these particular vampire bat populations are increasing. So researchers have done taste tests. Vampire bats don't really prefer human blood. They prefer cattle and chickens, different kinds of birds especially. So my advice regarding vampire bats is don't go to Central America and sleep outside naked and you'll probably be okay. What do most bats eat? Insects. This graph shows you what a majority of bats eat, mostly insects. Another large group are fruit eaters. Some are going to feed exclusively on nectar. And then we have these small individuals. We have the blood feeding bats. We also have fishing bats. And there's a few that will eat small mice and frogs. All of the bats we have around here are insectivores. If you get into the very, very southern tip of California, down in San Diego, there are a few nectar feeding bats down there. Another myth is that bats are pests, and I think this goes with, well, if they're rats, they must be pests, and they're not rats. Uh, in fact, bats eat pests more than they are pests. The Mexican free-tailed bats feeding over Texas eat 250 million tons of insects every year. That is a crazy amount of insects. It turns out the Gulf Stream will pick up insects down in Mexico and blow them up over Texas and then they drop down right there. And so there's a huge number of insects and there's lots of agriculture. And so this actually makes farmers in Texas the number one advocates for bat conservation because eating 250 million tons of insects is a lot of pesticides you don't have to spray. Bats are also really important pollinators and seed dispersers. When you cut down an acre of rainforest, 90% of the plants that regrow, regrow because a bat dropped a seed there. It's a perfect kind of seed dispersal for plants. They eat the fruit, the fruit passes through, it drops with a little packet of fertilizer and starts to grow. They also are really important pollinators for uh, a number of different species. The one that college students are usually most familiar with is the agave cactus. Bats are the sole pollinators of the agave cactus, so the only way we're going to continue to have more agave cactus is to have bat pollinators. And if you don't know already, agave cactus is what you make tequila from. So next time you have a margarita, toast a bat. And then finally, bat guano is an excellent fertilizer, especially from bats that primarily eat insects. That makes their droppings full of nitrogen. And when you want good fertilizer, you want fertilizer that has lots of nitrogen. So in some places, it's actually a career to go into caves and harvest guano and sell it. You can buy bat guano at local nurseries, and it's quite expensive. It'll be $10 a pound, something like that. There is a kiwi farmer in the Fairfield area who has a huge barn that's been taken over by bats, and he's let them have it. And he goes in once or twice a year and harvests the guano, and he swears that his kiwis are better than everyone else's because of that bat guano. Oh, no.